But uh, nowadays, uh, you know, everything is kind of huge amount of data that you have to make sense uh, of. Uh, so this business of estimation is uh, uh, absolutely crucial for data, data science. And uh, lo and behold, uh, statistics is the key for that. So if you haven't taken a course in the statistics department, I urge you <coughs> because in fact, there is a book, my favorite book on probability and statistics. It's called All of Statistics. Oops. And actually, preprint of this book is available. It has a few typos, but it's available for free on the web. And it's by Larry. whom I happen to know personally from my days at Carnegie Mellon, and he's really a very cool guy. And the book is only maybe 300 pages. But the book has a chapter, I'm sorry, a page with translations of statistical terms into machine learning terms. And actually, you know, Sir Carnegie Mellon is just a big computer science department, and all other departments are kind of satellites to computer science. <coughs> so most of his students are, in fact, computer scientists who do machine learning. And it kind of it goes quite deep, but without mathematical niceties. I mean. You know, what's the difference, uh, you know, what do I mean by that? Uh, it's, if you ask a mathematician, what's the most thing about uh, integral, Riemann integral, he will probably tell you, well, a function is Riemann integrable just in case the number of discontinuities is the set of discontinuities of measure zero. What's uh, the problem with this statement? The problem with this statement is exemplified with a joke, right? So you have this guy who is flying on hot air balloon. And I guess uh, he runs out of fuel and he lands into an own land. And uh, the first passerby comes and he asks him, excuse me, can you tell me where I am? And the guy says, you are in a hot air balloon. <laughs> and uh, the guy says, oh, wonderful, you must be a mathematician. Yeah, how did you know? Well, what you said is absolutely true and absolutely useless. <laughs> so, <coughs> if, in, if you ask a, a physicist uh, uh, what's integration all about, he will tell you how to approximately compute integrals using, you know, quad what's called quadratures, right? The trapezoidal rule of this and that. So, this book, you know, doesn't it maybe has footnotes to the fact that not all sets have probability that they happen. There are non-measurable sets and things like that. But it, it, it gives you all the practical stuff from pretty deep in statistics that are needed for machine learning. So I would really, really suggest download it uh, and uh, uh, go, and uh, there are beautiful exercises in the book. Okay, so now, what we want to do next is, and someone asked me, did you ask me uh, when is, uh, who asked me uh, when uh, uh, maximum likelihood uh, with the sensors, whether the error has to be Gaussian distributed? Uh, someone asked me about that. I hadn't actually had a chance to look at that yet, um, and I forgot, uh, I think it's actually pretty general. Uh, I think it's asymptotically uh, for almost all distributions. Uh, I'll check this. Uh, okay, why is Gaussian distribution so important? Uh, <coughs> for example, when you simulate noise in a circuit, uh, 
It's a pretty good uh, simulation if you use uh, a random number generator that produces Gaussian estimate, Ga Gaussian mean, Gaussian distribution. Um, if it's a Gaussian distribution, random variable. Why is that so? Central limit theorem. Central limit theorem. Who said that? Huh? Good. You know, central limit theorem <coughs> tells you if you have any distribution whatsoever and you average over a very large number of large number of uh, trials, uh, the distribution converges to a Gaussian. Uh, and in life, I mean, in, uh, you know, noise usually comes for a large number of mostly independent uh, uh, variables and somehow whenever you have and what you get is average of all uh, sources so whenever you have something that has multiple sources uh, uh, in all likelihood uh, it has a distribution that uh, behaves uh, close to being normal so this is why we the, the, this is where the importance uh, come from Okay, let me see what I'm supposed to. <laughs> okay. Okay, so remember now. Um, let's assume that we have n sensors, right? So this is S1, S2, up to Sn. And they are measuring the same environmental, say, quantity. So you will have measurement M1, M2, up to, uh, well, let's call it X1 in a more conventional so you get outcomes x1, x2, up to xn. And assume that you know the variances of each sensor. So you have variance v1, v2, up to vn. Right? And uh, uh, we assume that the sensors are unbiased which means that the mean reading of a sensor should be actually equal to the quantity. The, the expected value of the reading of a sensor is the true quantity. It's not giving uh, systematically, systematic errors. It's not overestimating or uh, underestimating. And now our goal is, uh, given these measurements, from sensors with these variances, what would be uh, the best way to estimate the true quantity, right? Say you have uh, N thermometers <coughs> and uh, uh, you want to estimate what's the true, true temperature after having made the readings uh, of these uh, sensors. Uh, well, one approach would be um, to choose the value mu of uh, the environmental quantity for which these readings uh, with these sensors uh, are the most likely. Right? So you want to, you want to choose uh, this unknown quantity so that uh, for that quantity, particular value of the quantity, if this was the true value, then the likelihood to get these readings uh, is the largest. Uh, right? So what is then the likelihood uh, given for a, for a uh, if mu is the uh, a true value given this vector of readings uh, x, right? So this is vector x. Well, <coughs> this likelihood is uh, the probability, and we assume that the sensors uh, 
the errors of the sensors are uncorrelated, right? Because this is very reasonable assumption. Well, what kind of totally reasonable? You know, if the variances of the sensors came from variance of manufacturing process, and if these sensors are not all from the same batch, then it's quite likely that the, uh, the, the their vari that the, uh, the, the, the their, uh, their features are uh, uh, uncorrelated. But unfortunately, of course, if you are from the same batch and this same batch has certain offset, then all of the variances of the sensors probably would be similar. Or if they are placed in different locations, of course, location where the sensor is placed uh, affects its uh, accuracy. But for the moment, uh, let's assume that they are independent. So then this likelihood will be just the product. What's the probability to have a reading so it will be i equals from 1 to n times probability given mu that uh, the reading is equal to xi, right, which is, of course, probability i equals from 1 to n. What's the probability of this uh, probability? If this is the true value, probability of this outcome is, of course, 1 over square root 2 pi uh, variance, right? Uh, times uh, e to the minus, and then here we have xi minus mu squared, just the Gaussian uh, distribution with two variance vi. So that's the likelihood if the value, true value, was mu to make this reading, because the readings are independent, it's the product. And uh, each probability is uh, governed by the Gaussian distribution. So now let's see what is the maximum likelihood when this is the largest. Of course, we have to find v over d mu um, of L mu x. So we want to see what true value of the environmental variable causes, has the, produces the largest lack, likelihood of these readings, right? So it's, again, this inverse problem. You are given the readings, and you want to estimate uh, the parameter. <coughs> so what is this? Well, if you differentiate, uh, you will have the following. Let me not mess it up. So first of all, we can, there is no mu here, so we can take it out. So it's pi i equals from 1 to n of 1 over square root 2 pi vi, right? And then uh, we have um, product of uh, e to the minus xi minus mu divided square divided by 2 vi, right? But what is this equal to? So this is equal, uh, let's to make things simple, let's denote this by q because it's just a nuisance factor. So q times what's the product of exponents? Come on, people, what's the product of e to something? How do you multiply uh, e to, what is e to the x times e to the y? Just keep adding them. Just keep adding them, of course. OK. Am I boring you or something? <laughs> no, really, I don't want to kind of, uh, uh, yeah. OK, let's just quickly finish, and then I'll run some simulations. I'm sure you will like it better. OK. But trust me, you cannot escape from math. 
I had a student coming and asking me, he says, I am really interested in machine learning, but I don't want to learn this statistics. <laughs> Uh, or once a student comes to me and says, I don't understand dynamic programming. I said, well, what about dynamic programming you do not understand? He says, all of it. <laughs> and uh, it was the textbook of, it was on my desk. <coughs> and I asked him, well, have you tried looking there? He looks and says, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so this is e to minus some i equals from 1 to n uh, x i minus mu squared divided by 2 v i. Uh, oh, I had to put v here, the derivative of this. And this can go out because it's a constant, so we want to differentiate this with respect to d mu. So what is the derivative of e to something? Well, that's e to something. So it's q times e to minus, and then this sum, xi minus mu squared divided by vi, right? Times the derivative of this, right? What is uh, the derivative? of this sum. So this will be minus the derivative of the sum is sum of the derivatives. So it will be sum i equals from 1 to n, 2 times xi minus mu divided by 2 vi, and then times another minus because of mu here, right? Okay, very good. So let us now so uh, what do we get? Uh, all of this is just, this can never be zero. So the only possibility is that this is zero, which means that we get uh, that uh, sum of, uh, right, and then also this and this cancels out, sum of x i's, uh, uh, let me see, sum of x i's divided by vi, all right? And when I move uh, this to the other uh, side, it will become uh, mu, so minus mu times 1 over vi, right? This minus cancels out, so you get this the reciprocal of this, and this has to be equal to zero. And uh, lo and behold, when you solve this, you get that mu is equal to uh, sum of xi over vi, and of course here I have sum, which I forgot, i equals from 1 to n, i equals from 1 to n, divided by sum 1 over vi. So the maximum likelihood estimation says you should take into account the readings of all sensors, but you weigh them with reciprocal of their variance. If the variance is small, the reciprocal will be large. If the variance is large, the reciprocal will be small, so no outliers uh, thrown out. You simply take into account all of the outcome, all of the readings, uh, but you weigh them with the reciprocals of the variance, and of course this is normalization, so that uh, uh, all the weights 
sum up to one, right? Now, <clears throat> one can actually show that <clears throat> if uh, the sensors are unbiased, no estimator can have smaller variance than this estimator because <clears throat> the, esti the variance of this uh, estimator reaches what's called kramer rao uh, lower bound and we know that uh, <clears throat> there can be nothing better than this. So in this case of Gaussian errors, independent errors with given variances, this is the best possible thing that you can do. Now, <clears throat> the question is this. These sensor readings, even if they are sensors, they are randomly, they throw sensors out of a plane. So you, you cannot really tell their variance because variance is influenced by the position. Um, also, some of the sensors might be faulty or the battery is low. <coughs> the point is, or the readings are not at all from sensors. They are, uh, they are marks that humans give, for example, if they referee papers, right? So knowing variances in most of the cases is totally unrealistic. Now, what iterative filtering attempts to do is uh, without knowing the variances, uh, but only having the readings, uh, it attempts to produce uh, a highly accurate value of the estimator. <coughs> so of, the, uh, of the, uh, the quantity. How do we usually do it? Uh, <coughs> we, the simplest way, if, if you have, say, uh, a, a paper got certain numbers of marks from each of the referees, uh, uh, what do we usually do with their marks? With average them, right? What's the problem with taking a mean as, uh, as, uh, <coughs> as, a, as an estimation? Huh? It is terribly, in, exactly, it's impacted terribly by outliers, uh, right? <coughs> if uh, two guys give zero scores and uh, one guy gives uh, five, well, on average, this was quite a good paper, right? Um, now, one way to do it would be to throw away the outliers. But who is an outlier? You don't know what the true value is. Uh, what iterative filtering algorithms attempt to do is by exactly the same procedure as we saw in the voting case, they try to simultaneously estimate the measured value and the variances of the markers. Right? To start with, what would be a good estimate to start with? Well, the mean, right? So let's say the, the value, estimation value zero is simply x1 plus x2 plus, plus xn divided by n. And uh, uh, usually it is the case uh, Fortunately, you know, if it was a single measurement, you would be pretty much in trouble. So they are actually, each referee uh, referees several papers, and, and every paper is refereed by uh, several people. Uh, so uh, say uh, the value, the score for paper VJ is equal to the sum of the scores, uh, uh, let's say, mark of the i referee 
to, for the jade paper when I goes uh, over all uh, um, markers who marked that question, right, divided by the simply sum of ones uh, for all i so that i mark paper j. This is simply taking the mean, right? If, so the idea is this is your initial estimate. So you have measurements here. So this is one, two, this is three, maybe somewhere here is four, and somewhere here is five. And then, and this is paper, uh, say, J, uh, J, uh, J. Then you have here, mark by one, here, mark by two, here, mark by three, say here, mark by four. So what we first do, we find a mean as the initial estimate everywhere. Now, given this mean, how can you estimate the variances of each marker? What would be the variance estimation of? So this would be, how shall we call it? Say, uh, MJ, the true mark. So how can you estimate variance of the eighth marker? Rough estimate. What would you do? So now you pretend that the mean is the true value. Square difference. <coughs> exactly. This is sum of uh, um, uh, mark of i of marker i for paper j minus uh, m. Let's call this zero. Uh, j and then uh, squared and uh, <coughs> with what number do I have to divide this? Uh, how do you estimate variance if you have say k many outcomes? Do you divide by what? This is sum of the squares of differences, and say the number of uh, uh, number of uh, uh, i's such that sorry number of j's uh, such that i marked j would be how many turns? But is this correct to put this here in the lecture notes? You will see that you have to subtract one. Right? So why is that so? It's mathematical mumbo jumbo because uh, this is not the true value, right, of the, uh, of the mean. This is uh, the, the true value. This is just an estimate, an average used uh, in lieu of the true value. So one can show that uh, the, in order for this uh, to converge to the true variance, uh, you have to divide uh, by the number of readings minus one, but that's a minus. So this is zero estimation of the variance of each sensor. Now we want to make a new estimation of the value. Well, we know approximate variance. So we can use approximate maximum likelihood estimation. So new mj1 will be equal to the sum of mij divided by vi0 estimate and then divided by sum of all Bj zero. Right? So what did we do? First we use mean as the rough 
estimate of the true value. Then we make a rough estimate of the variance of each sensor, right? Then we now, instead of giving everyone the same weight, we can give each reading a proxy well of the weight that is approximately <coughs> reciprocal of the variance. Now I can compute new variance Vj is exactly the same sum Mij minus Mj this times 1 squared divided by the very same uh, by the sum of the reciprocals now it is no longer this but sum of the reciprocals of the variance Vj um, uh, sorry, this is sum of the reciprocal of the um, blah, 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 blah. oh no 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 this is still uh, just the very same sum or uh, just the number of j's such that I marked j minus 1. And you keep now spinning it. So it's very simple. You have sensor readings, but you don't know the variances of the sensors. Then what can you do? You give equal weight to all sensors, which amounts to simply finding the mean of the readings. Now you have a very rough idea what the value might be. So you can then estimate how far from that value each marker is. You see, if this guy, you see, if you have an outlier, he, he is likely to be far away even from the mean. So this will automatically give larger variance to the outlier, and in the next round of iteration, his readings uh, will be prorated accordingly. And so, first you start with the mean, estimate variance. So okay. Once I have estimation of the variance, I use, a, so to speak, approximate maximum likelihood estimation. I get new values. So this is a better estimation. Compute variance with this new value. Replace it again here and keep sp spinning until the process converges. And lo and behold, you should get simultaneously, just like in voting, right? You have two dependent um, quantities. One was the trustworthiness of markers, which would here correspond roughly to the variance. The other are the ranks of the object, which should be here marks of the papers, right? And you start cycling, uh, alternating between the two until it stabilizes. It sounds very natural, but guess what? It doesn't work very well. What happens is, uh, that this guy has singularity when variance is zero. So in the process of recursion, if you ever get close to a particular readings of a particular sensor, he picks up, he gets very small variance and things slam into one particular reading. Right? So in, as you will see when we run a, a simulation the next time, in most of the cases it produces almost equally good estimations as if you had true variances, the maximum likelihood estimation. But sometimes it catastrophically fails. So then people try, this is the first, and it was published in uh, physics uh, letters, European Physics uh, Letters Journal, and then um, people try to fix this by essentially 
trying to avoid this singularity. And so then they proposed another method, but this method, um, this method also has terrible drawbacks. Uh, and then my students proposed a method that, a, uh, that a, a, a experiments runs the best. Uh, and I was pretty sure, but I didn't bother to try to prove its convergence until Ishrak managed to break it. And uh, lo and behold, now what I would like to challenge you is uh, try to fix the algorithm. First, try to analyze how Ishrak uh, uh, broke it. Uh, it might be really kind of contrived construction that in, in practice does not quite happen. Uh, and maybe the thing here really converges, but it can converge very slowly. I am not sure. At the, I haven't looked at that uh, for many, many years now. But, uh, but the problem is really crucial. You want to aggregate the scores uh, from sources. Uh, and you have no clue how accurate the sources are. What's the optimal way of <laughs> aggregating the scores? Right? So maybe market analysts uh, predict uh, the value of a stock. So that's not a discrete voting as we had before. Now it's a nu it's number. And you want to see what's the community of market analyst sentiment, what will be the future value. Of course, you can look at the history, what the variances of market analysts were, but they change. You know, it's unfortunately highly non-stationary uh, process, right? But this is, I would say, uh, uh, I, I, I think you would agree that it's an extremely important problem. And it offers you possibility. You will see how we uh, solve this problem of singularity. And we will run the simulations next time. But here is a very nice project. Uh, um, uh, just try to improve the algorithm. And I guarantee you that's a publication in a very good journal. OK. Yeah. And of course, you put me as a co-op, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a deal straight. Okay, guys, I'll see you next week.